I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging that I stand on Manitoc land. Sorry, here we go. That's where it comes. You hear that little tremble in my voice. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc, the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. I'd also like to acknowledge the thousands and thousands of people who have come before me with similar messages to the things that I am saying today, and I stand in their shadows. Sorry, I got this. I stand in their shadows, I stand on their shoulders, right? This, this work is work that, that thousands of people have been yelling about, have been whispering about, have been talking politely about, have been marching about, have been saying that black lives matter, right? And yeah. indigenous lives matter, got it, for thousands of years. Um, and, and so I work in that tradition. I center myself. I acknowledge my privilege as a white cisgendered male doing this work. Um, I acknowledge uh, my positionality, and I just want to put that out there before we start. Um, so I'm an educator, first and foremost. I knew that I wanted to be a teacher at a very, very young age. I left high school knew, knowing that I wanted to teach. And I wanted to teach because I saw education as the most powerful lever that I could exert pressure on to end systemic racism in our country, right? I, I decided that, I went to college knowing that, I became a teacher knowing that. And a large part of that work, of that journey, happened to me through my relationship to hip hop culture. At a young age, I was incredibly impressed by the ability of hip hop music and hip hop artists to use their artistry not only to reflect on, but to comment on the society in which we were living, right? And so I was inspired by that uh, sort of tradition of hip hop music and is at the center of everything that I've done as a teacher, right? It's, it's always there. Um, and through my life as a hip hop artist, as an owner of an independent hip hop record label, as a manager for hip hop groups, one of the, the most fortuitous encounters that I ever had was with a man by the name of Jared Richmond, or Acrobat. So Ak and I met on tour, um, 99, 2000, 2001, sometime around the, the, the millennium, and I was struck from the very outset of meeting Acrobatic about how genuine he is, about how open and kind and, and big-hearted and open-minded he is, and that all comes through in his music, right? And so the same things that I saw in the power of hip hop, I saw reflected in, in my man Acrobatic. So he's gonna talk with us a little bit right now about his work, about the work that he does now. Um, he's a professor at UMass Boston. He's a touring hip hop artist, world renowned, um, uh, an amazing guy, he's the best man at my wedding. Anyway, I could go on and on about this guy. I'm gonna let him talk to you and then we'll come back and we'll watch the premiere of The Mother's Wine. So, uh, you know, the first thing I want to say is just how proud I am of my friend here, Michael, for his work. <laughs> That's a well-deserved round of applause, brother. Um, you know, I share the same sentiment in terms of what I got from my initial meeting with Michael uh, all those years ago. I think it was like 99, bro. Uh, on a rap tour, you know, he's he's humble about it, but Mike is also a talented MC poet and You know at the time we were on the road together and Yeah, we were all experiencing a lot of that stuff for the first time just going out and being independent artists and Doing that as just young adults not even really knowing what we were doing But we knew we had a message that we wanted to get out there and so the power of hip-hop to deliver that message is something that is captivating um, and in the same way that it's been captivating to Mike, it has been something that has kept my attention since the moment I fell in love with hip hop back in probably, I don't know, 1981 or 1982 when my mom was playing Sugar Hill Gang records and Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five records on vinyl in the house. And, you know, eventually I got to a point where I was like, man, I, you know, I just love this art form. I love the fact that there's a way to say stuff in music without having to sing it, you know, quite frankly. And then in the beginning that was, okay, everybody's gonna throw their hands in the air and wave them like they just don't care. And in 
over the course of 45 years, we went from that to having probably the most effective way to articulate social issues that exist in our language. And so that means to me a couple of things. One is that we need to learn about this culture in the classroom. Imagine that, imagine, imagine a people being taken from their land and the language that they spoke for generations was banned from their use. They would get abused if they were caught speaking in that language. So you had to learn a new language instituted into your you know, lineage now. And then in a few short years, a culture can emerge and develop to the point where now rappers are winning Pulitzer Prizes, right? And so a clear and just thorough understanding of the culture and the people behind it is so vital because at this point in history we're living in now with technology and things being the way that they are, people are introduced to hip hop under different terms than you know, the little baby running around in his mom's place while she's playing Grandmaster Flash and the Sugar Hill Gang. Now there's algorithms kind of just directing everybody around. Now when you're nine years old, you're not listening necessarily to the music that your parents are introducing you to. You're listening to the music that the algorithm is telling you to listen to. And that algorithm, as we see in the news today right now, doesn't really care too much about our safety or the safety of our kids. The algorithm cares about selling stuff to us, right? So the version of hip hop that people are introduced to that involves, you know, what's being sold to you, I'm here to tell you that that is not the hip hop that I represent. That is not the culture in its purest form. And the knowledge and learning of the culture of hip hop is black history, it's American history. So to me, if an educational institution is offering a history curriculum and they don't have a study of hip hop in its curriculum, I think that it's an incomplete curriculum. And as we develop more, hopefully, more teachers willing and able to you know, share that information at different institutions across the country, then I think that we can work towards a solution and making sure that people exactly, you know, know what's going on with the culture. Me personally, unlike Mike, I didn't plan to be a teacher. I, I had no idea that that's where I was going to end up. I was a rapper. I wanted to be a rapper. I knew that from when I was 11 years old. Part of me wanted to go to school and be a journalist because I got the privilege of going to private school for a while. and you know, kind of had it indoctrinated into my mind that, you know, you go to high school, you get good grades, you go to a good college, you come out, you get a good job doing something. But at the same time, I knew I had this talent that didn't have anything to do with the schools I was going to. I appreciated the education and the opportunities, but what I wanted to do, A, wasn't being taught, and, and B, you know, there wasn't a lot of other people doing it. So I just kind of had to go out on my own and do that. And it led me down this path of experience that I mean, I feel like if, if I didn't decide to go down that path, I could have lived 50 lifetimes and not have seen and experienced the things that I've been able to see and experience. And as an artist, the whole experience was learning. From rap music, the names Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Huey Newton, Holly Selassie, all these names are names that I first heard in rap songs. And those things that I learned from those songs from people like KRS-One and Rakim and Chuck D, they, in the absence of any adult male anywhere around me telling me anything about any of this stuff, inspired me to go research and, and find out who these people were and what they were about on my own. So I stumbled across the autobiography of Malcolm X, not because my school taught me to do that or even suggested it. It was, be, but it's out there and it should be read, right? If it's, it's in the library, how come no one's telling me about it? 
And then all these aspects of my history start being revealed to me as I get into my teenage years and my young adult years. And I'm like, wait a minute. So, you know, the stuff that only KRS was saying, he wasn't the only one saying it. He was just the one I had access to. So when I got to, when I got to you know, private school, I started to realize, okay, so now, okay, only certain students have access to certain information. Yet the students who are most affected by certain information never get access to that information. Imagine. So as a rapper, I just wanted to put that into my music. I wanted to kind of embody what I thought the people that came before me did. Just as Mike said, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. You know, so Chuck D and KRS-One, thankfully, I've been able to meet these guys and have them affirm for me that I'm doing the right thing, you know. But we need more of it, and we need it in the classroom. It's absolutely vital because in my uh, experience with UMass Boston, I've come across so many different students from so many different walks of life, nursing majors, computer science majors, biology majors, all types of stuff, criminal justice. Without exception, they have all told me that they have been able to apply things that they've learned in a class about hip hop culture to their real life situations. Nursing students telling me that once they became registered nurses, it, you know, what they learned in my class actually helped them understand some of their patients better because of where the community is, where they're working, you know, stuff like that. And so, you know, that kind of makes you feel good inside. Like, okay, this is, this is supposed to be happening. And I was out doing shows, putting records out, just enjoying being a rapper, having my message in my music, but feeling like my message wasn't necessarily getting as far as I, it could. And I got asked by Rachel Rubin at UMass Boston to come in and be a guest speaker one day at her uh, pop culture and society class. She was doing a unit on hip hop. I went in there. It went so smoothly that, you know, the following semester she asked me to come in and co-teach with her. And then a couple years later, now I'm teaching for the Honors College and the American Studies Department by myself at a college that I dropped out of when I was 19 and I don't have a college degree. So I say that to say shout out to UMass Boston for giving somebody a shot for coming in through an unconventional way in order to give people who might even be, you know, I'm sure that a lot of those people in my classroom were smarter than me, more intelligent people than me, but I know what I know and I've experienced what I've experienced and having the opportunity to share it is great. And we need to have more unconventional ways of getting this information to people so that they know it. And that's why I support and I'm proud to sit on the board of self-evident education platform, self-evident media. And I'm going to pass it back to my brother, Mike, but it would be remiss of me if I didn't at least give you guys a little taste of what Mike is talking about in terms of creative expression and just, you know, rap artists, especially young black rap artists, especially having the opportunities to express themselves and ourselves, I'm not young anymore, but creatively, and to talk about what's going on in the world. Chuck D from Public Enemy called hip hop CNN for black people, you know? And it's true to a degree because a lot of times people don't come in to get the story from us. The story's about us, but it's never from us. So we all are sitting here with masks on, like I'm hearing you laugh, I, I wish I could see the smiles, you know what I mean? 2020 was a rough year. 2019 too, I mean, it's been a rough couple years. This is rough now. So I did some writing about that whole time period based on everything that was going on and just without a bunch of instrumentation to, you know, turn it into a party, I just want to throw some lyrics at you guys. Is that okay? Yeah. Now, okay, thank you, first of all. Secondly, I'm going to say there's some young guys in the room, so I'm going to be as close to the clean version of this as I can possibly be, okay? It's, a, it's nothing crazy, nothing crazy. Dylan, you're pissed. Dylan's pissed. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Let's see. For this one, I'll probably get a drone at my window. When all I'm doing is smoking some indica. Only weapon that I'm holding is a pen to flex my First Amendment rights, all right? 
I'm even spitting out a frantic pace living in this manic place. Man, it take a lot of damn mistakes to make a planet break. Highest office in the land got a rogue candidate and his clan saying they won't be replaced. From the tiki torches and Ouija boards, they claim that everything they're doing is to please the Lord, but that's looking at it oddly. It's hardly godly when you do us like George Floyd or Ramad Aubrey. Nah, we pulled the curtain back, and we see you hurting black, brown, white people and Asians. They want to do us all, and the reason's amazing, to build empires on our backs and call themselves made men. Man, F out of here. That's truly whack. All that Hollywood movie crap is a booby trap. To distract us from the facts of the matter, the feds come around and attack, and we scatter. See, this is the place of fables. This is the house of seven gables. With a joker in charge of getting it stable. They ready for their dinner and they setting the table. Then we jet into the cable news stations. We fighting about whose nation it is. Meanwhile, priests are raping the kids and the nonviolent offenders facing the bid because he's homeless and got caught taking a piss. This is one of history's craziest ages. Separate families, put the babies in cages. Outrageous, this house of no compassion. Cry for help, you might get your skull bashed in. Welcome to the house of horrors, the modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. We can expect much more of this shit show, tore up from the floor up from the get go. Cronyism, phony wisdom, and we all gonna be victims. We all know he should be lonely, but he got his cronies with him. Nepotism, never hidden. It's live on television. If it was you or me, I guarantee we'd be led to prison. Look, it's Freddy Krueger and Michael Myers, trailed by a steady crew of psycho liars. They got the people ready to light more fires because we can't trust what the news cycle supplies us. <laughs> Don't fall down that ramp, champ. You wouldn't want to show off your Vladimir Putin tramp stamp. Your vitriol gets your camp amp, but it's bullshit. We all know you about as bright as a damp lamp. So we get the daily Kaylee McEnany. I got something she can address. Guess is black and veiny. <laughs> the heart of her master, it pumps coal, you numbskulls. It's too late to save Trump's soul. Man, the world's spinning out of control. Want to catch a devil? Just follow where the funds go. Evangelists can't handle this. They don't want them, but they're scared to abandon ship. Unaware, they're the ones being tested. Tell them good riddance. This ain't about religion. This is crips and bloods with fancier duds. They just hide their hands so we can't see the blood. But they can't hide from their track record. All it takes is a little bit of fact checking. I've been qualified, calling out all the lies and the bullshit that got all of us horrified. Welcome to the house of horrors, the modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. We can expect much more of this shit show. Toe up from the flow up from the get go. Michael, I love you, brother. So this quotation here has, has been at the center of this work. As, as so much of James Baldwin's thinking has, has influenced the work of this project, but this idea that the past is what makes our present coherent and that the past will remain horrible for exactly as long as we refuse to assess it honestly. And that's what we're trying to do here, right? We're trying to, we're trying to assess our past honestly. We cannot understand our present if we do not understand our past. And if we can't understand our present, we can't envision, much less build, a just future, right? We can't, we can't imagine a world with, that hasn't existed before until we understand the world that came before us, right? And so that's at the center of, of this mission. Um, and I'm gonna share with you just a little bit of a, of a backstory about self-evident education, about the work that we've done. And then I'll share um, some previews of some of our episodes and then we'll watch our newest episode called A Mother's Bond. So I don't usually pay much stock to horoscopes. <laughs> But this is my horoscope from this morning. <laughs> you will be unusually convincing today if you are discussing controversial matters like politics, religion, or racial issues. Now, I want to I wanna rewind, right, and say that the word controversial, I think, has no part in that sentence. And, and my horoscope has been telling me things like this recently. Like I'll wake up in the morning and it'll say, avoid discussing controversial issues like politics, religion, and racial issues. And I'm like, dude, that's my job. Like I, that's, I can't. Should I just go back to sleep today? Um, so I just thought that was funny. Um, 
All right, so very quickly, uh, there's Acrobatic. You met him. He's right there. That's him. You don't like that one? I like that one. I like that picture. This one. You don't like that one's good. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, so this work started in earnest in 2019. But as I said, the work for me started started well, well before that, right? Um, 2019 was just when this all sort of coalesced and and I and I put together this team of folks who I've been working with for for years um, and we just sort of hit the ground running because we all understood each other we all understood the ways our, our minds worked and and what we were trying to do in the work um, so this is the advisory board we've now become an official 501c3 so we are a nonprofit so the many of the folks on this board are now uh, on the board of directors. Um, let's see, what else do we have? All right, so, you know, I don't have to spend too much time, I think, belaboring these points, but I, I think it's important to understand, right, that that we have these issues where systemic racism remains a seemingly intractable system. If you take a look at demographic data and you look at things like infant mortality rates or maternal mortality rates or incarceration rates or unemployment rates or educational attainment or wealth, you can predict things in all of those categories based on racial characteristics and, and other identity markers, right? So. That remains an issue in our society. It has not yet gone away. We've got a lot of educators who are hesitant to engage in these conversations, and those who are ready don't have the, the materials or the resources or the experience to be able to address them um, in, in the ways that they need to in the classroom. So our solutions at Self-Evident, and we don't claim for these to be the only solutions, but the ways that we know how to do this is through storytelling. right? I think that that stories really have a power to change us, to change our attitudes, to change the way we think, to change the way that we see the world, and they have the power to change the world. In a, in a really um, fascinating way, I think stories allow us to enter into conversations that we might not have known we were ready to have. Or, or we wouldn't have had, we would have run from if it weren't for coming into the conversation through a powerful story. So that's at the center of our work. The center of our work is storytelling. Um, what we're doing is not building an actual library because that's not what we're doing. We're building a digital library, right? I think that's the most powerful metaphor to talk about what we're doing. And we're building this library in the way that all libraries are to have multiple sections that serve multiple purposes, right? So part of it is to build the resources that students will engage with in their classrooms or other communities, but also to build the library in a way that supports educators so that they feel ready to have these conversations. Um, and to continue with the metaphor of the library, we have yet to get the multi-million or billion dollar funding we need to build the whole library, so we're building it one book at a time. Um, and so we currently have seven amazing books. Um, the first episode that we produced was one about Elizabeth Mumbet Freeman. That's a story that takes place here in Massachusetts. Um, she sues for her freedom based on language within the Massachusetts Constitution about the equality of, of all mankind. And she says, well, I should be free then too. And she won her freedom. Um, we have one about Benjamin Banneker and a powerful letter that he wrote to Thomas Jefferson in 1791, where he directly calls Jefferson out on um, the contradictions based in the words that he wrote. You know, he writes this letter and says, you have these beautiful words in the, in the um, Declaration of Independence about equality and freedom, yet you own enslaved people. You support the institution of chattel slavery. Um, and we see this, you know, oftentimes I think one of the things that um, when people think about the past, you know, you think about a person like Thomas Jefferson and people often say, you know, well, you're judging him with, you know, your your contemporary moros and your contemporary way of seeing things. And he was just a man of his time. But a story like Banneker shows us that Jefferson wasn't a man of his time necessarily and wasn't just following the ideas of his time. He was setting the ideas of his time around race and racist ideas. And people like Banneker were consistently calling him on it. Or people like Thaddeus Kajuko, who uh, was a, a Polish national who fought in the American Revolution alongside Jefferson, Franklin, Washington. And he encouraged these guys publicly 
to stand up and 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 say that these ideas of individual liberty cannot live alongside a system that enslaves and dehumanizes people, right? Because Juco used his positionality, right, as a as a white man involved in the army to say we need to we need to change this so much so that he left in his last will and testament all of the money that he earned during the revolutionary war was supposed to go to free enslaved people and to pay for their education he made the mistake of making jefferson the executor of his will and jefferson negated and went back on on that promise of using that money to free enslaved people. So again, you know, I think we can push back on these arguments that, you know, so and so is just a man of his time or their time. Um, then we have this episode about Elizabeth Key, and we're going to show you a, a, just a really brief preview of this episode. They sued for her freedom on the basis that her father was free and also because by then she had uh, become Christian. And in English common law, the, the paternity or the status of a child derived from the father. And it was also against English common law to enslave a Christian. People begin to equate legality with morality. Right or conflate the legal implications of something with like the ethical nature of it. My baby will not suffer the same fate that was unjustly given to me. I've already suffered enough for the both of us. We deserve our freedom. The jury agreed. The colonial court ruled in her favor in 1655. Quote, Elizabeth ought to be free. She and her family were awarded compensation for the additional 10 years she endured of enslavement. Clearly, this frustrated the ruling elite. She sued for her freedom and won because English common law thousands and thousands of years say the status of the child is derived from the status of the father. And the courts agreed and they freed her. And within 10 years, the colony of Virginia changed the law to say the status of the child is derived from the status of the mother. Right. And this is a law that has fundamental implications for the remainder of the history of the institution of chattel slavery in the United States of America. It means that every child who is born to a woman who is enslaved is now enslaved in, per, in, in perpetually. It's lifetime servitude, right? And this is, a, this is a system that has not existed anywhere else in the world up until it's instituted in the United States of America, right? The, the slavery that exists in the United States, in the, in the colonial Americas, and then in the United States is different than any other system of slavery that has existed in time. And this case of Elizabeth Key is going to be really important when we watch A Mother's Bond and we think about the implications of this of this history, of the legacy of this of this case um, of Elizabeth Key. So then uh, the next one that we have here um, is about the Red Summer of 1919. And this is the, the first one we made in a, in a series of four that we plan on making about um, racist violence in the United States of America in the early 1900s. Um, so I'll show you a clip of this one, and then I think we'll just get into A Mother's Bond um, and go from there. Nineteen nineteen. World War I had just ended. Over 300,000 black Americans had enlisted in the army, with tens of thousands fighting overseas, including the 8th Infantry Regiment from Illinois and the Harlem Hellfighters from New York. The country was relieved that the destructive international conflict was over. However, in the United States, 1919 would prove to be an extremely violent year. 
And by 1919, over a half million Black Americans fled the South in the first wave of the Great Migration, an exodus to escape the brutal realities of violence in the South. Among these migrating families were thousands of Black World War I veterans seeking jobs and a better life. They were proud of what they had just done and thought that they had earned the rightful place as full citizens. These Americans, vying for a dignified and prosperous life in society, were met with a different reality. This country of ours, despite all its better souls have done and dreamed, is yet a shameful land. What they really wanted was pretty simple. It lynches. It disenfranchises its own citizens. They wanted the Constitution to be fulfilled. We return from fighting. We return fighting. Make way for democracy. And so that um, episode specifically focuses on two, two moments during 1919, Chicago, Illinois, um, and Elaine, Arkansas, and looks at um, what happened there and the systemic failures of the, the legal system to protect these, these folks, these citizens of our country. Um, there's one more. I really feel like I want to show you guys the um, Sojourner Truth one. So um, we also have one on on Tulsa 1921 on the race massacre in Tulsa 1921. This one um, meant a, a whole lot to me um, on a number of different levels. I'll just talk about it very quickly and, and we, we won't watch this one right now. Um, but I, I had the opportunity to work with two people on this episode, both of whom are descendants of survivors of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Um, uh, Mary E. Jones Parrish was a, a single woman living in Tulsa in 1921, and she wrote a book and chronicled what happened to the people who survived this um, destruction of an entire community uh, within within 24 hours. Um, and her great great granddaughter um, actually voices her great great grandmother um, on the episode and her niece voices the daughter um, who, who plays a part in, in the story. And then another, um, her name is, is uh, Annalisa Brunner. Um, and then Seth Bryant worked with us as well. And he's the great, great grandson of AJ Smitherman, who was a journalist who also chronicled what happened in Tulsa, chronicled it with such accuracy that um, he was actually driven out of Oklahoma and spent the rest of his life living in Buffalo, New York. Being a wanted man in Oklahoma, he was wanted for inciting a riot because he accurately reported in his newspaper the ways that the black community came together to protect a, a, um, a potential lynching victim. Um, so the black community came together. There was a, a, a young man who was – there was a threatened lynching. The community came together. Smither, Smitherman wrote about it, and because of that, he got accused of inciting a riot. Um, all right. Sojourner Truth, this one um, is is super uh, powerful to me, um, Not no pun intended, it's called The Truth is Powerful, um, and it really, it looks at the, the two public versions of Sojourner Truth's most famous speech, which is often misreferred to as Ain't I a Woman, um, and we'll see a little bit. I think it'll give us the, the basic context, I think you'll be able to understand it, but for those of you who aren't familiar um, with the story of this speech, Sojourner Truth was born and raised in low Dutch speaking New York, right? So she grew up around people who spoke uh, a dialect of Dutch um, and was not raised in the South. Yet the most famous version of her speech is written in this stereotypical Southern dialect. Um, and, and it was written, it was published 12 years after she gave it. Um, by a white journalist. And there's another version of it that was published like a month after she gave it, and it's written in standard English. She sued Dumont for her son's freedom and became one of the first black women to successfully challenge a white man in court and win. The Lord gave me sojourner because I was to travel up and down the land. 
showing the people their sins and being a sign unto them. And the Lord gave me truth because I was to declare the truth to people. In 1843, she changed her name to Sojourner Truth and began an itinerant ministry that soon became feminist anti-slavery activism. When I think about what it means for Sojourner Truth's speech to be represented slash misrepresented slash re-represented by a white woman years later, it, it reminds me about that, it reminds me of that tension, right? Of who has authority over self, of, of what it means to be authenticated. This quest for seeming racial authenticity explains the substitution, ain't I a woman, for aren't I a woman? Just to be clear, Truth said neither of these things. Her speech is one of the most famous speeches by a black American woman, but sadly, is a prime example that illustrates how many of the stories of and about black women were not allowed to be portrayed and told through their own lenses. And in some cases, that still happens, even today. When we think about true freedom, we have to think about what it means to undo the ways that the, the white gaze, the lens of whiteness continues to seek this control over black narratives, black voices, and black lives. So we have to interrogate it because whoever and whatever Sojourner Truth is, is powerful in its own right without white validation and without that white lens. And that's, that's the kind of freedom that we need in this moment. Thanks to the phenomenal support of our community, we have a we have a grassroots um, funding foundation uh, that has raised you know over a hundred thousand dollars over the course of the last couple of years. We've had some uh, um, help from. Foundations like the Northampton Education Foundation, the Beverage Foundation. We've been in conversations with a with a number of other foundations as well, and we've had the ability to get into schools um, across the country. Right, we're working with Clayton County in Georgia. It's one of the hundred largest school districts in in the country. Um, we're doing work in Virginia. We're doing work in Massachusetts, in Illinois, in Oklahoma. Um, it's really been pretty phenomenal and pretty inspiring the way that that this work has has spread. Um, so I want to talk to you about the the episode that we're here to premiere. Um, and, I'll, and I'll do it quickly because I want to get into to watching the episode. Um, this one is really, really special uh, because the partnerships that went into making this episode are, are really inspiring to me. We worked with Historic Northampton. We worked with the Northampton Education Foundation. We worked with the Northampton Public Schools to produce this episode. Um, Historic Northampton did a bunch of phenomenal research on the story of Catherine Linda, a story that's very uh, little known, right? It's not in history books. It's archival research that really had to, to dig it up. Um, and, and so we took the research that they did and then used that as our jumping off point. And I had, I had three phenomenal interns from the high school who helped to research the story, who helped to write the story, who helped collect the visuals that we used to tell the story. And then I had this amazing group of middle school students who I worked with, with Dr. Holly Graham, uh, a, a classroom of seven students. Um, and and the insights that they gave into the story, the ways that they understood this story, um, the help that they gave me to think about how do we tell this story in a way that's going to engage people, that's going to get at all of the themes that we want to get at. Um, it was just really, really inspiring, right, to, to put this information into the hands of young people and say, all right, how do you understand this and how can we um, make this understandable to others? Was It was just a really inspiring um, moment for me. So you'll see some of those students featured in this episode. Um, 
Anything else I should say, hon? No, we're good. All right, cool. So let's watch this. Oh, here's, I know there was one thing I wanted to say. So in the episodes, um, there are reflection points. And when we use these in the classroom, we pause at those points and we ask the students to interact with the material they've just uh, engaged with. So we're going to pause at those moments and I'm going to ask that you turn and talk to someone, uh, could be the person you came with, could be a complete stranger, um, whatever you, you're most comfortable with. But just consider the questions that are on the screen um, and We'll give you a minute or two at those moments just to sort of make sense of what you've seen and think about what is coming next. Make sense? Cool. All right, here we go. Without further ado, I present to you a mother's bond. This is the story of a woman with two first names. A woman we know very little about. We do know that she took a long journey that started and ended in Savannah, Georgia, with Massachusetts in the middle. A long journey that highlighted the difficult circumstances of an enslaved woman. Welcome to Self Evident, where we take you deep into fascinating stories of American history and encourage you to critically examine the histories and the legacies of the creation and weaponization of race in the United States of America. I'm Michael Lawrence Riddell, or as my students call me, Mr. LR. Joined by Gail Pemberton, my co-host for this episode. This episode is called A Mother's Bond. Savannah, Georgia, 1845. Like many Southern communities at the time, people amassed their wealth from the labor of the enslaved. This wealth and the comfortable lives it afforded was protected by a system of violence designed to keep enslaved people from seeking freedom, liberation, or independence. One of those enslaved people was a woman named Catherine Linda. 900 miles north of Savannah in the Connecticut River Valley in western Massachusetts lay Springfield, Massachusetts. It was an important New England city of industrial innovation and commerce. Despite the fact that slavery was illegal in the north, many northern industries were inextricably linked to the systems of slavery. What we have to think about are the social relationships uh, between wealthy people in the United States, uh, those who owned slaves and lived in the South, those who are part of what made up uh, what scholars, some scholars call the river of gods of the Connecticut River, that made money off industry, oftentimes selling those products from shoes to other manufactured goods to the slave South. You know, banks, textiles, factories, all kinds of industries in, that are thriving in the North that can, you know, on its surface look like it has nothing to do with slavery, actually deeply connected with the slave economy. The runaway slave advertisements were printed in the North, in Northern foundries, and sold to the South. Not everyone in Western Massachusetts was an abolitionist. A vocal group of citizens supported and even benefited from the institution of Southern slavery. And a large portion of the population was apathetic. A lot of times people assume that once somebody kind of crossed that Mason-Dixon line that they're wholly free, but that was not the case. People who make it to the North spend their entire time looking over their shoulder and the law of the South, the law of the land, the federal law, which was the fugitive slave law, was respected in those places. These two worlds, Savannah and Western Massachusetts, and their beliefs about slavery and freedom would come together in one case. In 1845, 15 years before the Civil War, a woman named Catherine Linda, who was enslaved in Savannah, Georgia, was brought to Massachusetts by her enslavers. It was in Massachusetts that Catherine Linda expressed the desire to be free. Mm. 
How does this story make us think about the ways that the North and the South were both connected to and influenced by slavery? Would you argue that the North at this time in history was anti-slavery? Why or why not? So we're going to keep it moving. We're going to hear from some of our young people um, that we present in the video. Generally, the, 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 the theory on their reflection times is we, we, we don't choose places where the students who we feature in the video answer these questions directly because we don't want anyone to think that, you know, this is the right answer and, you know, the other answers are wrong. But we, we want to present students with people who are around their age presenting their ideas. So here we go. Because it really shows the struggle that a lot of African-Americans went through and just trying to find the basics for human life. I think it's really surprising that even when slavery was abolished in Massachusetts, it was still so hard to get free. And also just the gravity of the choices that people had to make when they were trying to get free. She was wanting her freedom and thinking of that. It's because she didn't want to be enslaved no more. She just wanted to be free. She probably wanted to be free because she was probably tired of being enslaved. While the specifics are not known, we do know that in the summer of 1845, Catherine Linda, an enslaved woman traveling with her enslavers, William B. Hodgson and Margaret Telfair Hodgson, arrived in Springfield, Massachusetts. Part of the reason why those who held slaves felt so confident bringing women like Catherine Linda to places like Massachusetts was because they had their families in the South, in bondage, you know, basically held like captives. When a child was born to an enslaved woman, that child was the legal property of the enslaver who claimed to own the mother. Family is the biggest tragedy for enslaved people because at the end of the day, they had absolutely no control over whether or not they could stay with family members or not. I took my own freedom, and so could you. One sweltering summer afternoon, Catherine Linda sat at a servant's table in Warner's Tavern. As fate had it, also at that table was D.W. Ruggles, a self-emancipated man. Could I do it? Could you help me? I could. Do you desire liberty? I do. I want my freedom. Ruggles put her in touch with Erasmus Darwin Hudson, a white abolitionist with connections throughout the region. Word reached her enslaver, William Hodgson, that Catherine Linda was hoping to gain her freedom. He took her to Northampton, Massachusetts, and checked into the Mansion House Hotel, claiming that he was traveling alone on business from New York. Sadly, we have no record of Catherine Linda's words about what happened to her at the Mansion House Hotel or anywhere else. Her words are lost to us. But what we do know is that Erasmus Darwin Hudson and B.W. Ruggles attempted to get Charles Dewey, a Northampton judge, to swear out a complaint that would free Linda from Hodgson. A petition would have to be signed by someone who had heard Catherine Linda say that she wanted freedom. I do. I want my freedom. As misfortune would have it, E.W. Ruggles was called out of town before he could sign the complaint. So Erasmus Hudson and another abolitionist, Moses Breck, went to the Mansion House Hotel to speak with Catherine Linda herself so that they could file the complaint. We are here to see Catherine Linda. You cannot. You have no right. She does not want to see you. The abolitionists were disappointed, but did not give up. They went to see Judge Charles Dewey again. Eventually, Judge Dewey ordered that Catherine Linda be brought before him so she could speak for herself. Dewey sent the sheriff to the Mansion House Hotel. 
The sheriff took Catherine Linda's arm and started to remove her from the hotel. But as Mrs. Hodson was looking on with watchful eyes, Catherine Linda protested, denying she was enslaved and refusing to leave the hotel. The sheriff again took her by the arm to lead her away to see Judge Dewey. We can only imagine what Catherine Linda must have been thinking as she traveled to speak with the judge. Catherine Linda appeared before Dewey. Judge Dewey let the room know how he would rule in this case. You are free if you choose to be so. Do you think most people know about the story of Catherine Linda? Why or why not? Why do you think Catherine Linda was so reluctant to be taken out of the hotel by the sheriff? Let's uh, wrap, wrap it up. In my classroom, I had a little ding. And the idea was, you know, I never wanted to interrupt someone in the middle of a thought. I wanted to give students a, a, a clue, you know, that it was, I should have brought my bell. I was derelict in my duty. I apologize. Um, but uh, let's keep it moving. It's important that we make our next generation aware of these stories because being able to reflect on these stories and what these people went through, being able to apply these experiences to our real world issues, moving forward, it may be able to help prevent a lot of issues that we might have in the future. Stories like this show that what we learned in schools wasn't always exactly accurate and that even after abolition, in some places it was still really, really difficult for people to get free if they wanted to. They weren't allowed to read or write because they would have a sense of what's going on and if they had a sense of what's going on they can earn the freedom back. She was enslaved and um, she was like unknown. Liberty was within her reach. You are free if you choose to be so. One can say that for a few brief moments She was free. While we do not know what Catherine Linda would have been thinking when Judge Dewey told her that she could be free, we do know that the woman who claimed to own her, Margaret Hodgson, said, She has children. Catherine Linda faced a devastating choice. She's a thousand miles away from her children, knowing that she will never see her children. There is... No way. The judge's ruling could not include her family. And so Catherine Linda returned to slavery in Georgia. Not every effort to emancipate someone was successful. And in this case, what you see is another level, which is uh, the real agency on the part of Catherine Linda to choose to go back the love for family, the connection with with loved ones, supersedes individual liberty. In the years following Judge Dewey's ruling, William B. Hodson filed a suit in Catherine Linda's name accusing the abolitionists of violating her rights. Catherine Linda's name and voice were used to sue a man who assisted her in an attempt for liberty and Hodgson won. As you consider everything you just saw and heard, we want you to think about these essential questions. Where in this story do you see the intersections of race and gender, and what is happening at those intersections? How can this story help us to think about the complex decisions that enslaved people had to make in order to live their lives? What does this story tell us about whose voices get heard and whose stories get told? 
think the one most important thing is that she got her freedom, but she didn't want to leave her family, so she went back. And it's not even a freedom if you don't have your family by your side. It must have been a really difficult decision to make because she knew that being enslaved was so unbearable for her, but she just couldn't leave her family. She, she wanted to be free, but she chose her family over freedom. She picked her family over freedom. To make the future better, you need to look in the past. If you don't, you won't really know what to do. Until next time, this has been and will continue to be self-evident. So I'd like to invite up uh, to join me up here, um, Professor Usman Power Green uh, and Acrobatic. We're going to just talk a little bit um, about some, you know, questions that we have, things that we want to talk about and point out, and then we'll take some Q and A from from the audience. Um, thank you all so much. You know, I think the the first thing I'd just like to hear from 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 both of you guys about um, is. You know what are the what are the themes that really stand out to you in in this story? Um, you know you've been involved, Usman, in this from the beginning to the end of this episode. You know, Acro, you're seeing seeing this you know for the first couple of times today. So I'd just love to hear the the sort of impressions about what are the what are the important themes that that we should take away from this. All right. I'll, I'll gladly start. I mean, I think that the most overwhelming thing about it for me was uh you know the decision that that linda was faced with you know of being free or being with your family and you know I, I was just saying to mike like this would make an incredible movie you know what i mean because people seeing and you could even see how the, the kids were moved by it you know what i mean people seeing that seeing someone in real life, even if it is from the past, being faced with that type of a decision and a decision that they actually made, that's really powerful. And I just think that it gives you a sense of just how much you are taking from someone when you deny them their freedom, you know, to, to the point where someone would still rather stay with their family who doesn't have that freedom you know, then just go off on their own and, and be free and try to do something from that position. So I think that that's really important. And then the other thing I picked up was kind of just more of a symbolic thing, which was we didn't hear too many words from the subject of this episode. And I just think that that's really symbolic of the stifling of the voices of black women throughout American history. You know, the only thing that she said that I remember from the episode was, I want my freedom, you know? And it's like, once that freedom is there, then the story can be told. And that is kind of the pathway to the answer to the question of whose story gets to get told. You know, I think that in this country, we're used to all the stories being told from the perspective of John Smith and Adam and Luke Skywalker and Tom Cruise as the last samurai. And Eminem is the first rapper. He said, let there be rap. And then Acrobatic came along. KRS-One after that. You get what I'm trying to say. You know what I mean? But th those are the type of things that had, you know, this, those are the types of things that were going on in my mind as I was watching this, aside from the fact that it's just so well produced and well done and essential. Hey, everybody. Um, Whenever Michael comes to me with these ideas, I'm always like, wait, what, who, who's that again? And I'm the historian. Uh, so I will say that, um, again, those of us who've read, uh, you know, the, the, the classic Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, how many people read that at all? Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, Linda Brent. Y'all need to all go out and read that um, slave narrative. That pretty much 
I'm actually shocked that, that y'all haven't read it, but um, yeah, so, so my point is that in, in the 1850s, 1860s, we did have a moment where we had uh, a black woman, uh, in this case, Harriet Jacobs, write a slave narrative, a very sort of long, exciting tale that was a huge, huge, you know, sort of uh, publication moment. And what she was able to do in the slave narrative was capture the sorts of experiences that we get in this one sentence, right? We got to trace through it, but an entire slave narrative. Um, and, uh, you know, other sort of historians have sought to do the exact work that, that Michael and others did with this episode in trying to show that despite the fact you have one really prominent slave narrative and then Sojourner Truth and some other ones, there are so many stories like this that capture the themes that are in this, you know, longer sort of narrative. And, uh, you know, we're just scratching the surface in terms of being able to get, to get all of them. Erica Armstrong Dunbar, who came two years ago, I think now, uh, to Northampton and spoke Never Caught is her book. Um, that dealt with Ona Judge, uh, who was uh, enslaved by George Washington, was another sort of example where she was able to take a short, um, you know, basically it's not that long. I showed my students a uh, sort of slave narrative towards the end of her life, and she took that and said, all right, let's do a whole entire sort of book that really traces her life and, and brings it beyond that. And uh, I had my students talking about sort of the narrative of George Washington and, and how historians intervene by just, you know, through looking at the actions of, of one of the people that he sort of, you know, didn't stop pursuing uh, to, to re-enslave. And so, um, so, you know, the whole time from the beginning to even watching this now with Imani and sort of thinking about this for all you, I think it's an opportunity for us to sort of, you know, continue to go back and, and, and see opportunities to, um, to learn more about African-American women in history. And uh, everyone who hasn't read Incidents in, Life, in the, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, download the PDF or go pay Bedford series, whatever money they pay for the reprint, because uh, it was reprinted probably about eh, six years ago. So anyway. Um, so two things. One, you know, on, on your point, um, Ak, about the the lack of her voice in this episode, right? I think one of the things that you'll you'll realize you might not have noticed as you watched this, but the only two characters who the sole visual depictions of them are a contemporary artist rendering were the two black characters, right? We had a picture of Moses Breck. We had a picture of Erasmus Darwin Hudson. We had William B. Hodgson. We had Margaret Telfair Hodgson, but we had to create pictures of D.W. Ruggles and Catherine Linda, right? Because they, they, they're, likeness and their words and their and their thoughts were thought to not matter. Um, so I think that's uh, super important. I think the other piece, you know, that, that you talk about when you bring up incidents in the life of a slave girl, um, Jamila Liscott, the woman who spoke at the end of the Sojourner Truth episode, one of the things that she speaks about in our interview, it didn't make it into the episode, but but we have it, um, was how the um, these these quote unquote slave narratives um, would often be preceded with a with a note at the beginning by a white author saying, I authenticate this story. Like they needed a white voice at the beginning of it so that a white audience would read it and, and would believe what was being said. And I think it goes to this idea of the ways that, you know, certain voices uh, get to articulate their own stories and then and then other voices don't. And I think the more and more we move towards a a, a, a vision of society where all of our voices and stories are, are, are centered. Right. And we're not talking about, um, you know. Uh, 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 fixing the the problems of the the people who are in the margins, but we're talking about bringing the people who are in the margins into the center uh, and centering those voices and those stories. Right? Then then we're just going to keep replicating systems of inequity. Um, and so I think it's really important that we that we continue to try to center these these stories. Um, we've got like 10 minutes and I'd love to, to open it up to questions from folks in the audience. If people have them, if people don't have them, we can always just keep talking. Cause I'm not sure if you've met us yet. <laughs> yes. Roxanne Neiman. Um, I just, I'm, I see fifth grade. These are geared towards 
middle school and high school, right? Um, you know, so that was, that was my intent when I first started. I was a middle school teacher. I was a high school teacher. I did teach elementary school at the beginning of my career. Um, but in speaking with teachers throughout the country, we've had, um, teachers in grades as low as third grade using some of, of these resources. Obviously, you know, the, the ones that are, um, where violent, where actual physical violence is, uh, more of a central factor in the story, like the 1919 one and the and the Tulsa 1921 um, one. We would recommend those, you know, for upper upper grades. Um, but we've been I've been sort of astounded by the the range of folks who have engaged with the resources. Um, Betty Sharp, who I don't think is here, but she's the co-director of Historic Northampton. Um, she used our resources last year in a class that was um, women between the ages of 19 and 65. And then we had, you know, teachers, like I said, as, as young as third grade using them. Um, I think with the proper scaffolding, right, it, it obviously needs a lot of, of, of context and, and, and work from the teacher to help the students understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Dale. Oh yeah, I meant to say that. Not only did she have children she would be leaving behind, but those children would be controlled by and at the mercy of the slave owners. And I yeah. Think that's very yeah. powerful. Yeah, yeah, right. And I think we were trying to, um, we were also trying to allude to that at, at one point where we said um, under the under you know Mrs. Hodgson's watchful eyes or something like that. That sort of threat was in there. And I think, um, I mean that kind of threat was was clearly articulated um, by in other times and places. George Washington in the in the Ona Judge um, uh, situation re relayed a message to Ona Judge that said, "Return to slavery." And we will continue to treat your family well, right? Which, which clearly the opposite of that is don't return and we won't continue to treat them well. And I think, you know, as Usman said, and I'll let you talk on this because I think you, you spoke about it in the, in the film, um, was that was part of why uh, enslavers felt comfortable bringing enslaved people. I mean, that was a piece of this story that I had never really thought about or, or considered that there was sort of a, an enslaver tourism industry, right? Where, where people who owned slaves in the South would travel to the North when slavery was abolished in these places, but they would bring enslaved people with them. And so slavery was, was happening in these parts of the country that we assume, you know, were, was, was North good and South bad when we, you know, sort of simplify it down to that. And so there was that threat of violence, right? It was like, I'm going to bring you leave your family back here and that's going to make you come back because because you love your family oh supporting materials yes um so we have uh with each episode there's a module of a uh, suite of curriculum that teachers can use to follow up because really one of the the central premises of this idea right is of this project is that we we get people to enter into the conversation through a story but we want that story to be connected to the bigger and the broader systemic themes that that because so often we think about this as stories of individuals, or at least that's the way that we've been taught to think about, uh, you know, when 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 someone gets called a racist, they think I'm not wearing a, you know, clan hood and, and burning fires. Right. And, and they're so stuck in this like racism as a product of bad individuals and not as a system that functions without these bad individuals really anymore. Um, and so that's what the, the, the resources are really designed to help students and teachers delve further into those. Um, and the resources 
there's creative activities. There's, um, you know, some that are built for, uh, you know, talking, conversations, there's writing, there's, um, I'm, you know, not doing a great job representing all of the different modules um, and sort of modes of learning that the, that the resources represent. Um, but yeah, there's a, you know, eight to 10 follow-up activities that go with each uh, module. Did you want to comment? No. No. All right. Questions. I think I saw your hand first and then over there. Doing something not, not directly, um, and I'll let you weigh in on this sort of as the as the historian. Um, but one was, you know, it's unbearably hot in the South in the summer, right? And so people in the South would come north, particularly business people who had these intersecting business interests in places like the north where the where the factories are that are they're delivering cotton to or you know they have these business interests and so they would they would coincide their journeys to come north to do business with the summer months when it was when it was cooler and then also there's these social relationships right there are they they have friends in in places where slavery doesn't exist and they might be you know it might be part business part pleasure um, but we don't have the we don't have the discrete finite information about what the hodgsons were doing here yes Northampton, right. the right. Northampton, yeah. the community that largely has taken the kind of stories of Springfield without the people. Right, right. right. So I'm just interested because I, I grew up in Holyoke. We didn't hear these sorts of stories, right? It was, you know, if you, if you were morally better, you wouldn't be here. Right. right? So I, I think the kind of power of this is, is so huge. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, so definitely yeah. looking to expand the places where we're working with. We're working with. Um, the Veritas Charter Prep School Network in in Holyoke. I have a connection um, with the woman who runs the elementary schools in Holyoke, um, and reaching out to some principals of schools in Holyoke, and then also trying to expand into Springfield. Um, one of our supporters has connections at the Springfield YMCA, so he's really interested in trying to see if we can. Uh, one, he's like, I think this would be a powerful model to use in out of school time programming, um, and two. You know, he's like, I have this connection, so let's see if it can work. So that's definitely on our on our goal, um, our list of goals for this. And we just actually submitted a couple of grants specifically designed towards working in in Hamden County in Springfield and and Holyoke. Yes. But I'm struck by how there's another group of people whose own voice voices we don't really hear now, and that's um, people fleeing Central America, fleeing, fleeing violence, fleeing poverty, fleeing climate change, um, and faced with a very similar intense choice of, of getting not liberation in that, that sense, obviously, but just you know, survival yeah. and leaving the kids and the rest of the family behind or not. Um, and it just, it just I, I don't know what to say. Imagine there's no countries. You know, that's, right. what I, that's what I think. Yeah, I'll let any, either of you guys have thoughts. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, my thoughts are that the oppressive institutions that have existed in the world continue. Slavery exists in the world, you know. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why, you know, people in Britain were so attracted to slave narratives. Um, you know, there's a reason why people uh, in India, for example, when when um, African-Americans went to India, you know, particularly in the, in the 50s, uh, they, you know, they, they would say to, to, to King and others, Booker T. Washington, up from slavery, up from slavery. You know, they, they connected with the story of black Americans and race and caste uh, for that reason. And it continues to be the case, you know, when I travel around and 
and uh, you know, do lectures and talk to people. People connect with this history. They're they're fascinated by it, and I, and like you, they're fascinated by the connections between now and and back then. Um, the institutions are obviously very different uh, in, in specific ways in terms of the structures, but the the goal being to exploit people and hurt people and maintain power, you know, continues. Right. So that's why there's a lot of continuity, actually, uh, when you look at different iterations and you're thinking about, you know, Martin Delaney, who I'm writing about now, naming his children Toussaint, you know, and sort of through naming just in the 60s, all the naming that happened. You know, I get Usman, you know, it's like there's so much continuity in black social political movements. Um, and a lot of it's through names, uh, through representation. So. Um, yeah, hopefully people take that from this. And when you read Incidents in the Life of Slave Girl, you're going to email me and we're going to think about, uh, you know, Holocaust and Anne Frank's diary and what it's like to hide for eight years in an attic from, you know, enslavers. And there's just so many interesting ways in which uh, people find connections with the work. Um, so, right. And even rappers and musicians, right? Of I mean, you know, as I'm listening to all of this, the, the first thing I, I thought about was just that on a very basic level, you know, even without the history, America is just a very xenophobic place. It's like we market ourselves as the country that accepts everyone, yet we're definitely the place that's afraid of everyone. So that part about it makes it really interesting to me when we talk about like the immigration crisis, because look, where where our borders are, right? Like if there was some type of humanitarian crisis in Canada and everybody had to come down, it would be fine. But if they're coming from the South and the people are brown, that's out of line. You know, damn, I need to write that. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's good. Just lyrics coming out coming out of nowhere. But 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 but, <laughs> but seriously though, it's like the the fact that you know there is some just deep rooted fear. It's like. Okay, we all came over here together. We took this place by force. We stole the resources. We killed the people who were here. And it's ours now. This is how things are done on Earth, and we're here. So anybody else that's from any other group that's not like us, that doesn't look like us, is a threat, and they are not going to come take our shit, period. That's how it is. That's how we're looking at it. And that's what our country is based on. And now there's a fear growing because the numbers are changing, and people are getting on TV and saying, oh, our country's getting darker and dirtier, and we don't know why. And the people who are coming in are being associated with that. And for some reason being associated with the crime that's been already happening here with the people who have already been here for all this time. So the xenophobia, like just getting past that, being able to look at somebody that doesn't look like you and not be afraid of them is a huge step. And in that regard, and this is not to offend anybody in the room, there needs to be, you see how they have those MAGA rallies with Donald Trump and everything? They need to just do one of those with all the cool white people. And get all you guys together and talk about, yo, how can we just deal with this in a common sense way so that these people that are giving us a horrible name can be mitigated a little bit because they need to be marginalized. Really, xenophobia needs to be marginalized. And just to speak to the question a little bit earlier, I, I, I think that this stuff should be brought to as many different types of students as possible, of course, right? But just as important as it is for people to know their own history from the sense of being oppressed, it's important for the people who benefited from the work or the deeds of those oppressors who are now finding themselves in a position where they can make a difference to be first in line to get that education about what was really happening because we know that those people are kind-hearted people and if they knew what really happened and what was really going on, they would divert some of their resources to things to make that better. So that's why we're sitting up here. <laughs> we could have a we could have a, a magfo rally. Make America great for once. Um so uh shoot, I had another idea and then I just made a dumb joke. Um all right, yes, question. I thought it was the category of beyond unmitigated gall that guy sued Using her name. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. The, the, the circular logic of that. Is bound to respect. Yep. Right. 
rights. Right. That could be violated. If you don't have rights, can your rights be violated? Right. 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 And I mean, the other thing, just as we think about the legacies of this story, right? In in Georgia, the the Georgia State Historical Society Archival Library is called the William B. Hodgson Library. The 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 Telfair Museum, right? Margaret Telfair Hodgson was the daughter of Edward Telfair, who was the governor of Georgia, right? And so this is a this is an aristocracy family, right? That 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 comes here, and those those names still populate the landscape of the state of Georgia, right? So if you're in the state of Georgia, you're going to read the archives of things that happened in the state of Georgia, and you're going into a building that's named after a man who enslaved people and fashioned himself a scientist, right? And so he collected all of these documents that are in the archives of, of his efforts to uh, prove and articulate the inferiority of people of African descent, right? And so th that's 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 also part of this story, right? Is that this this landscape is not the you know it's what's his name the writer with the dust um, your guy Faulkner, um, <laughs> you know the, the 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 thing he said right that the past is 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 never dead. In fact, it's not even past, right? And so I think that's what we really need to understand. Oh, I know what it was that I wanted to do, and then Marty has a question. So I would be remiss if I did not express my undying appreciation and love for my beautiful family who sits over here. Lauren, Dylan, Blaze, I love you guys. I do this because of the love that you have. You allow me to express my love in public and my love for my brilliant friends uh, who work with me and ride with me and are down with me. I'm just like, I'm just uh, blessed beyond belief by the people um, who believe in me and support me in this work. Marty. So the suit was in Massachusetts, um, but the, and and we don't really know from the documents. I think there's some some digging in this story clearly that's that's left to be done. But from the documents that I've seen, it's not really clear whatever happened that 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 Hudson ever actually had to to do anything. There's some letters from um, there's a letter from I think it's Garrison wrote to him and was like, "Don't worry, dude." Like this is just BS. Like they're not going to actually make you pay the money or like go to, go to prison, but it's unclear exactly how it all, how it all played out. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, listen, we're beyond time. Um, you know, I could sit and talk about this stuff all day, but there's a block party happening out there. There's food from Masa Mexicano. If you have never eaten there, you should go eat there. Get the fried achiote chicken sandwich. It's the best sandwich in all of Northampton. That's my hot take for the, for the afternoon. Um, thank you all so much for coming out. So much love for all of you. Um, yeah, 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 thank you.